Well, please turn with me in the third and final of our installments of our little study on Jesus' Sermon on the Plain. We're going to be reading in just a moment from Luke chapter 6, beginning at verse 37 down through verse 49. A few years ago, the British Museum in London had a fascinating online exhibition. In that exhibition were items like a second century Roman vase. There was a medieval English gold coin. There was a, a fantastic jeweled Renaissance necklace. Now you might ask, what do these items all have in common? A, a Roman vase, a medieval English coin, a Renaissance necklace? And the answer is what they all had in common is that they were forgeries. That Roman vase, fake. That medieval English coin, fake. That Renaissance necklace, fake. Now you can pull up these pictures online, you can look at them. You would be hard pressed to tell that these are forgeries, but expert eyes have concluded that's exactly what they are. Well, that's true in the world and sadly that's true in the kingdom of God. There are true disciples and there are fake disciples and you would be hard pressed to tell the difference just by looking at them. So what to do? Well, we don't look, we listen to what Jesus has to say. And let's do just that as we turn again to his word. And before we read, let's ask his help in prayer, shall we pray? Father, we thank you for your word. It is a light shining in a dark place. It is a lamp to our feet. We pray that you would give us eyes to see the Lord Jesus Christ revealed in his mercy and grace in your word. We pray by your spirit that you would draw us near to him, that trusting in him, that we would walk with him and that we would obey him, living to his glory. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hear now God's word. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. He also told them a parable, can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone when he is fully trained will be like his teacher. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, brother, let me take out the speck that is in your eye, when you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take out the speck that is in your brother's eye. For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil, for out of the abundance of his heart the mouth speaks. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood arose, the stream broke against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. When the stream broke against it, immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. Well, thus far God's holy word, may he add his blessing on it. Uh, we have we have been with Jesus as he has spent the night on the mountain. He has prayed to his father and he has chosen 
12 of his disciples, whom he named apostles. He begins to make his way down the mountain, and he finds himself crowded by disciples and by crowds, an international gathering. And he begins to minister to them. We're told that he works great miracles of healing and of exorcism. And then he proceeds to teach them. This, this is what we call the, the Sermon on the Plain. And in verses 20 through 26, Jesus shows us those who are truly blessed in this world. They are not blessed from this world, but they are blessed of God. They find themselves empty because of sin, barren as they look out on all that the world would offer for satisfaction and joy, and, and they'd have none of it only in God. And Jesus says, God will satisfy you. And then sadly, there are those who would fill themselves up on themselves and this world. And, and Jesus pronounces a woe. And he says, if you stand before God on the last day, full of self and, and full of the, the emptiness that is the world, you will lose what you have and, and you will rue eternity because you will, you will spend it under the wrath and judgment of God. And Jesus then goes on to say in verses 27 to 36, that those who are supremely blessed of God, they, they go out into the world and they are not blessed by the world. The world will deal harshly with them. It will spite them. It will misuse them. It will revile them. What are we to do? Jesus says, love your enemies. It's a hard call, but he shows us what it is to do it and how we're to do it. And then Jesus draws his sermon to a close, the portion that we've read. If Jesus has addressed his disciples in relation to God, if Jesus has addressed his disciples in relation to the world, now he gets to the, the very heart, the very marrow of what it is to be a disciple. And he does that as he makes his way through these steps, a word about judgment in verses 37 and 38. That's the first step. A word about the kind of teachers we should and should not seek out. That's verses 39 to 42. And then the very meat of discipleship, verses 43 to 49. What, what is a true disciple at bottom? And you see what Jesus is doing is, is he is drawing a line between the false disciple and the true disciple. Who is the counterfeit Christian? Who is the one who has the form of godliness but lacks its power? Who is the one who has the reputation of being alive but is dead? And so what Jesus does is he, he identifies who the counterfeit Christian truly is. And so I want us to look at the, the three marks of a counterfeit Christian as, as Jesus presents them here. And the first is this, the counterfeit Christian lives by a double standard. Look at verses 37 and 38. Here we meet what I think are probably the most misquoted words of Jesus Christ in the whole of the New Testament. <clears throat> judge not and you will not be, and be judged. Condemn not and you will not be condemned. How often the world flings these words back at the church. How dare you Christians call us to account? How dare you tell us what we're doing is sinful or wrong? Didn't your Savior say, judge not and you will not be judged? Well, what's the problem with that? Well, for one thing, Jesus says in John chapter 7 at verse 24, judge righteous judgments. So Jesus knows that we are to judge, that it is right and proper to judge. And in fact, even the world knows that. The world is, is playing the hypocrite when they wag their finger at us and say, don't judge me. Because when the world says you should never make judgments, they're making a judgment. You see, the, 
the proposition is self-refuting. So what is Jesus saying? Well, you see, Jesus is saying there are judgments and then there are judgments. You, you need to make the right kind of judgments. And Jesus is warning us against judgmentalism. He's saying, don't look to God to judge you with a generous standard when you turn around and judge others with a stingy standard. And so Jesus is at looking at his disciples and he's asking them, tell me, how are you treating other people? And he, he speaks of those who have a critical heart and they're critical of everyone and everything around them. No one is good enough. No one gets anything right. And he knows that's an attitude that sadly is present in the church. And someone who is so critical is also so self-assured. The standard is the self. And Jesus is saying, you, you are so confident in your own opinions. You are so sure of your own righteousness. You, you quickly size people up, their, their failures, their wrongs, their missteps. And you only have a word of condemnation for them. You are merciless and you are rigid in applying that standard. And as Jesus lays out this warning, he helps us to see what the problem is and where the cure lies. What's the problem? The problem very simply is this. If, if God were to deal with any of us in this way, there wouldn't be a single one of us left standing. How did the psalmist put it, O oh Lord, if you were to keep a record of iniquities, who could stand? The answer is no one. And Jesus says, if, if you insist on treating people this way, then understand God is going to treat you with that strict and severe measure. With the measure with which you measure, it will be measured back to you. Now that's the problem. Where's the cure? Well, the cure comes in Jesus' words, forgive and you will be forgiven. Now what's Jesus getting at here is, this isn't some tit for tat. If, if you just gin up enough forgiveness and compassion for other people, then maybe, just maybe, God will be for merciful and forgiving towards you. That's not what he's saying at all. He's saying, how does God forgive you? God sees all of your sins. He sees them better than you will ever see them yourself. And he is pleased to overlook your sins, to pass over them, to cast them into the depths of the sea, to separate them from you as far as east is from the west to place them behind his back. And he doesn't ignore sin. Sin has been paid for, and that has come at a dreadful cost. It has come at the cost of his only beloved son, whom he sent into this world, to be that lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And those sins covered by the blood of Christ are forgiven. And he will never cast up the, the dust and dirt of your past and forgiven sin into your face. He, he'll never say to you do, you, do you remember that holiday with your family in 1995? Do you remember that conversation with that elder in your church five years ago? When God forgives, when God pardons his, his mercy, covers that sin. And Jesus says, now, you go and treat others that way. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. What's, what's the picture? The picture is, is someone who is coming with a measure in their lap, and, and they're there to get grain. And that grain is, is put down into that measure. And it is, it is pressed down and it is, it is shaken. 
to to let as much grain fill that measure as possible, and then it and then it pours over. And Jesus says that's that's how God deals with us. He he is abundant. He is overflowing. He is complete. He is full. And Jesus says, has has God been this generous with you? Then you go and you be generous with others. And Jesus says, the way you treat other people is a direct window into the way you understand God. And if you are merciless with others, you can't turn around and look to God to show you mercy. But when you show mercy to others, that shows that you have understood and you have truly received mercy from the God who is merciful to the kind and ungrateful. Well, how does this apply to us? Well, you know, we we live in a world it, it doesn't live by these words of Jesus. We live in a world that is on the one hand given over to sin it is permissive to the extreme about sin and yet how often the world is without mercy it is quick to condemn how often we see today the world is so confident of its own wisdom and righteousness we see this in our leaders we see this in our talking heads we see this on social media And that's the spirit that we breathe in this world. And that tempts the hearts of every disciple. And so Jesus is asking you, he's asking me, how do you treat others? The members of your own family, the people to whom you minister, the people within your church, do do you avoid them? Do you despise them? Do you think you're, you're better? than they are because you've you've read more theology, you've read more Bible, you think you're more devout than they are. If if someone were to pull them aside and ask them, what 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 does this person think about you? Well, what would they say? And Jesus says, as you take stock of the people in your life, how do you think God is is going to treat you? And Jesus says, some of you are living by that double standard. And Jesus says, there's some of you who who are true disciples. You you look to God for mercy, but you, you know how hard it is to strive against a critical spirit, a censorious, condemning spirit. What do you do? And you know the cure for both cases is the same. You, you go straight to Jesus Christ because there is forgiveness and there is mercy in Jesus Christ. That's, that's why he came. You, you see Jesus as he walks this earth and the very people you think he would admire and seek their approval, the, the learned, the devout Pharisees, says he has nothing but rage and contempt for them for just this reason. And the very people you think Jesus would have nothing to do with, the sinners on the margins of society, they're, here they are, they're, they're cut to the heart for sin and, and Jesus' compassion goes out to them and, and draws them from sin to himself. And then there's that remarkable instance on the Damascus Road. Here is Saul, that raging Pharisee, blind with rage, and Jesus Christ in compassion stops him in his tracks. Friends, if if Jesus Christ can have compassion on Saul of Tarsus, he can have compassion on you and on me. And that is Paul's own testimony to Timothy. There is mercy abounding in Jesus Christ. Will will you come? Have you come? And, and if you have come and you're struggling against that critical and censorious spirit, 
that so displeases the Savior, what do you do? Well, simply this, every morning you arise and you say with the scripture, Lord, your mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. You open up the word of God and, and you remind yourself what, what a God we have. He is merciful to the kind and ungrateful and to the evil. And Jesus says, you, you go out into your world and, and you love and you serve the people in your life in that spirit. Rise from your closet. You, you go deal with the people in your life the way God has dealt with you. It's a, it's a hard thing to do, but it's a blessed and a wonderful thing to do. It's, it's what Jesus calls you and me to do every day of our lives. So there's the first thing Jesus says, the, the first mark of a counterfeit Christian, you live by a double standard. And then the second mark, it comes in verses 39 to 42. Learn under a corrupt teacher. Counterfeit Christians learn under a corrupt teacher. And Jesus says many things about false teachers in his ministry, but there are two things here especially that he pinpoints. First thing he says, these, these teachers are blind, and he begins to describe them. Can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. When, when you go to a museum or to a set of ruins, <clears throat> you, you look for a qualified guide to show you around, to tell you what these things mean. You, you don't grab another tourist like yourself to explain what's happening here, what these things are. And Jesus says that's exactly what's taking place here. A, a blind man goes and, and he finds someone as blind as himself. And what happens? Well, Jesus says that disciple becomes like his teacher. You know, that's a, that's a principle we see worked out every day in the church, don't we? Disciples become like their teachers. Churches become like their pastors. And the blind become like the blind. And the outcome is that the blind teacher leads his blind disciple straight into a pit, straight into destruction, and neither of them knows differently. Well, what does it mean to be blind? It means to be blind to sins and faults. It means to be blind to the mercy and grace of Jesus Christ. And that, you see, is, is brought out in, in the second description of these corrupt teachers, verses 41 and 42. They're hypocritical. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Now you see Jesus is speaking to a disciple who is fully formed, just like his teacher. And he's, he's there in the church, and he can spy out a speck of dust, and he has this load-bearing beam that's protruding from his eye. Who would ever look to someone with a beam coming from his eye as someone who could remove a speck of dust from the eye of another? Jesus says, you are so skilled in picking out the tiny little faults in others, and you cannot see the glaring, huge beam that is protruding from your own eye. What does this say to us? Jesus is reminding us of the high privilege and responsibility that it is to be a teacher in the kingdom of God. Every time we're teaching someone, we are molding, we are leading someone somewhere. And as God has given you opportunity to teach others, what are you teaching them? Or closer to Jesus' point, where are you leading them? Are you leading them into a pit of destruction, Jesus says, or are you leading them to me? Are you leading your disciples in the way of Christ-likeness? Are you leading your disciples to the, to the feet of Jesus Christ, that they would become more and more like him. That's, that's our goal. And we ought to be praying with and for one another that this would be happening in our own lives and ministries. 
And then Jesus warns us, doesn't it? Doesn't it? That there are false teachers. And they're not only out there outside the church, but sadly, they are within the bounds of the visible church. And they are blind to sin. And they are blind to the grace and mercy that are found in Jesus Christ. They are blind to spiritual need. They are, they are consumed with the world and the flesh, and they're in service of the devil. And Jesus wants us to know these teachers do tremendous harm. Are we looking after the sheep under our care? Are we serving those whom we teach that they can identify these false teachers, that they would look out for them, that they would have nothing to do with them, that they could distinguish, here is a true teacher, here is a false teacher. I will go to the true teacher because the true teacher will lead me to Jesus Christ, and that one will lead me straight into a pit. That's why our teaching in the Word of God is so important. And we give ourselves to this day after day, prayerfully, looking to Jesus Christ to form disciples, to draw them close to him so that his sheep, hearing his word, would not follow the voice of another. So we've looked now at two marks from Jesus' teaching about a false teacher, about counterfeit Christians. The second, a counterfeit Christian follows a false teacher. And we come to the third one and the final one and the one Jesus spends most time on. He says a counterfeit Christian is someone who is happy to leave his speech alone, who is happy to leave his heart alone. He's happy to have the name of a Christian and ignore his speech and ignore his heart. And so Jesus says, disciples, in the first place, look at your speech. That comes in verses 43 to 45. No good tree, he says, bears bad fruit. Nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. Out of the abundance of his heart, his mouth speaks. And you see Jesus' point. Each tree is known by its fruit. And the good person, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings good. The evil person, out of the evil treasure of his heart, brings evil. You know by looking at that tree what kind of a tree it is because you see its fruit. My wife has planted in our side yard a peach tree and an apple tree. And as the months roll on, I, I forget which is which, particularly in the wintertime. But come May and June, there is no doubt as to which tree is which, I only have to look and see what kind of fruit is growing on each tree. And I see apples on the tree on the top of the hill, and I see peaches on the tree on the bottom of the hill, and I know which tree is which. And Jesus is saying that principle is alive and well in the kingdom of God. Well, what is the fruit? And Jesus says, verse 45, out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. A harvest of bad fruit points to a rotten heart. Rotten speech means a rotten heart. Wholesome speech means a wholesome heart. And Jesus says, you look at the speech and that will take you right down to the heart every time. People say, but it's just words. They don't mean anything. And Jesus says, don't you believe that? Words mean everything. Words expose what is going on deep down in the unseen parts of the core of who we are. So Jesus says, Look at your speech. What does it say about your heart? And then Jesus says, look at your life. Verse 46, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? You see, people are perfectly content to call Jesus Lord, but their, their lives betray the reality. 
They don't do what their Lord tells them to do. That's a strange lordship. You would, you would call him Lord, and then you would turn around and ignore him. And Jesus says, if that's you, then I am not your Lord. And he, he gives that famous illustration. You've got two men, and they, they build a house. And one man goes to the time and to the trouble to dig deep. Did you notice he lays a foundation on the rock? Now, if you've ever watched a home being built, you know how important the foundation is. And imagine in the days before power tools and construction equipment with just primitive tools and back and muscle power, people digging into rock painstakingly, slowly to lay that foundation. And then another guy comes along and he says, you know, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of effort. It's a lot of time. It's a lot of money. I'm just going to build a beautiful house. I'm not going to worry about that foundation. And you know, it is a beautiful house. It's a wonderful house to live in. And those two houses look identical until Jesus says one day comes and there's, there's the flood. There's the storm. And the one with the foundation is unshaken. And the other, immediately it fell, and great was the fall thereof. It is destroyed. What's Jesus talking about? He's saying, this is what it's like for those who hear my words. If, if you hear my words and you do them, then when the day of judgment comes, your house will stand. And if you hear my words, Jesus says, and you don't do them, then the day of judgment will come and you will lose everything. Well, as, as we close, how does this apply to us? Now, well, each one of us names the name of Jesus Christ. He is our Savior. He is our Lord. We, we hear his word, and that's good. And remember, Jesus is speaking to people here who are prospective teachers. That would, that would be people like us. And Jesus has some questions for us. And the first question he asks is, what, what is your speech like? What does your speech say about your heart? You know, those are, those are two things we may not put together. But the great physician of the soul is diagnosing your life and mine. And he, he is pointing to this symptom. Just as when, when you go see your doctor and your doctor at your physical is asking you all sorts of questions about your body and you don't think about so many of the things that, that he asks. But he's asking them for a reason because he's trying to find out if something deep down, something unperceived, is going on that needs medical attention. Jesus, you see, is doing the same thing. What does your speech say about your heart? And then Jesus says, are you a hearer and a doer of the word? It's not enough to hear. It's, it's not enough to talk and to teach. You have to be a doer of the word. And, and it's hard work to lay that foundation. It's hard work to be a doer of the world, word in this world. But Jesus says that's, that's all that's going to matter on the day of judgment. And Jesus presses us. And he says, if your speech and your life shows that your heart is rotten and evil, what do you do? And the reason Jesus is teaching this is so that we would not hide our sin, try to cover it. But Jesus calls you, he calls me to take our sin to him. And remember who you're dealing with. Jesus is not a Pharisee. Jesus will not rain down blistering condemnation upon you. There is mercy in Jesus Christ. And, and Jesus can take a bad heart 
and he can put a good heart in its place, a good heart that will bear good fruit. And it, as you look at your life and, and you look at the words of Jesus, you, you say, Lord, I am a true disciple. I, I love you. And my speech, I, I want it to glorify you. And, and my life, I want to be a doer of your word. And I, I do see fruit of that in my life. But, but Lord, even, even this week, I, I have been shocked at some of the things that have come out of my mouth. And I look at my life and, and I fear there, there are things that are unstable in my life's foundation. You know, Jesus puts the same cure in front of you. The physician, he, he prescribes the very same cure. He says, don't, don't hide it. That's, that's Satan's deceit. He did that to our first parents. And he's been doing it to sinners ever since. Don't give in to the lie. You take that sin and you bring it to me. Jesus Christ, if he commanded Peter to forgive 70 times seven, how much more will the Savior forgive the likes of you and me? And you say, I've, I've committed this sin so many times. And, and here it is. I've been walking with him for so long. And I'm, I'm ashamed. How, how can I possibly ask his forgiveness? And he says, you bring that to me and I will have mercy on you. And you see, Jesus is showing us, isn't he? Here, here's what a true disciple is. A disciple is not someone who is perfect and shining, at least not yet. A disciple, you see, is someone who is close to Jesus. A disciple is someone whose speech and his life and his relationships are not disintegrated, but they are integrated. They are whole because they all say the same thing. They all say there is mercy in the Savior. There is mercy for me and there is mercy for you. That's, that's a true disciple, not someone who's putting barrier after barrier after barrier between himself, between herself and Jesus Christ, but someone who is close to Jesus Christ, someone who lives transparently before Jesus Christ, someone through whom Jesus Christ in his grace and mercy is shining to those around him. That's, that's the kind of disciple we, we aspire to be. Those are the kind of men and women and children we want to see coming to the Savior and walking close to the Savior, that they would reflect Jesus Christ to those around them in their lives. What a joy it's been to go through these words of Jesus Christ. They're not easy words. They're, they're simple words, but they're hard words, but they're wonderful words because they are filled with grace and truth. God grant that you and I would take these to heart, receive them in faith, and by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, that, that we would live them out to the glory of his name. Let's, let's ask his help and blessing in prayer. Father, we're so grateful you've given us this time together. How we thank you for the searching eye of Jesus Christ. How we thank you for his compassionate heart. How we thank you for a word that is so understandable, that is so clear and yet reaches so deeply down into our lives. Father, help us to find him to be our only refuge. That we would not cling to the rags of self-righteousness, that we would cling rather to his hem, his garments, and be covered by his spotless righteousness, one for sinners like us, and that we close to him would bear more and more his resemblance, that we would be sons of the Most High by grace, and that we would live out in our teaching, in our ministry, in our lives, in all that we have and are, what it is to be a follower, a disciple, 
of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, bring this about for your glory. We ask this in his name. Amen.